I got out of school, I worked as a janitor in an office building and I worked as a, as a color separator, which was good, at a printing place. But I couldn't get any um, art, I couldn't get anything going with the galleries, though they were nice to me, but they didn't know what to do with my stuff. And I couldn't get commercial illustration work, so I just left town, like got in my pickup and drove to LA. Then I just went around with my book and um, got illustration work and you know album cover art work and stuff. The differences in styles that show up, just like even from panel to panel mm -hmm. in the comics, is that something naturally that happens? Because sometimes it'll, it'll just be suddenly very clean out of nowhere, the lines will be. Yeah, I thought it was interesting to do, to mix up styles, because it's really easy for me to change style. And so at that, that was kind of earlier, usually. And also I was trying to attract attention, though. You're young and just like, gee, look at me, everybody. I can draw like this and that. But it also was kind of like pairing the, pan, the style to the emotion in the panel, in a way, trying to go along with that. And so I've done projects all different styles, and now typically an issue of a comic is more like one style throughout in a way, though it might like gradually tighten or something like that. I'll do games like that where the style might subtly change in an issue. But um, no, I like doing that. It's fun. And it comes from just wanting to absorb all my heroes' work, you know, Jack Kirby and all those English pop artists and stuff. Is there a set point where Jimbo came from? Yeah, I drew him one time in 1974 when I was still at the end of college. I was doing stream of consciousness comics, but then I was studying cargo cults and stuff, and I was trying to figure out a way to tell stories. And I just drew his head, and uh, I went, wow, that looks kind of like Dennis the Menace and Joe Palooka and various other things. And uh, I don't know, it stuck. The first time I drew it, I knew it was something. Even though it wasn't like my favorite thing or anything, it just emerged like, okay. I'm here. And uh, so then I started drawing my first long stories that really had beginnings, middles, and ends, you know. And a lot of them unpublished, thankfully. So my comics, you know, come back from a show, where do you put like massive amounts of frame stuff? Are these the purgatory ones? Or yeah, that's the purgatory pages, you yeah. know. It took about like a month to draw each page. Did you like it? Because you did uh, you did one one panel a night, correct? That's what I tried to do. Or, I could just do you know like about five square inches a night, and then I had to like keep you know just keep going. It's it takes a long time to draw. So this was a crazy comic. Then I got uh, these are older ones that are like big big pages. Is that from? Uh... This is from the Pantheon yeah. book, I think. Yeah, I drew about twenty new pages for that Pantheon collection. And how did you get involved with like the people from Slash Records and Slash Magazine? I was walking down Gower Gulch one night and there was a Slash Magazine laying on the newsstand and it was the sensibility I'd been doing, which was like big crude graphic stuff that's probably out of fine art type of stuff, like Rauschenberg and Schwitters and all that kind of stuff. I'd seen something in the paper about punks and I thought, ooh, these are like cre creepy little neo-Nazis, you know, what a bunch of jerks. But mostly it was people out of art school who wanted to make something happen and had a sense of humor and they were all looking for interesting records. And then when I went to the first Slash parties, everyone's singing along with these English imports and I'm like, gee, what, what station do you turn to to find out? Are you to have to have a ticket to England or something to find out about this? How do you feel about colorizing your, your work? Well, adding a layer of color is different. I like it just in black and white. Mm -hmm. And so when, when we're coloring it, I, I'm going to keep it really simple. I could totally do paintings under each one of them, but black and white comics is kind of enough in a way. So this will be like some tint overlay, I guess, on this one. Yeah. Yeah, I've been in LA about 10 years and um, it was time to, time to go. That's about the same time that uh, Pee Wee's Playhouse Yeah, was I accidentally moved here when the TV show was sold to CBS. Where did the ideas for the, uh, the set come from? Were those developed through the course of like the old theatrical? It's funny because the, the theatrical set was super simple. There's almost nothing there, but it has this ragged outline on top and pastel colors and some spray-painted patterns and this irregular door. 
and it drove people crazy. They really responded to it in this giant way, and, but that was like with no budget. Then when we had a real budget, we could go crazy, and, but it's all done in a giant rush, you know? So it's not like finely tuned or anything. The first day at work, and I, you know, start to read the scripts, because you have to read the scripts to find out what needs to be uh, portrayed or, you know, where things happen in relation to each other. And the tank commander guy walks over to me and goes like, where's the plans? All the carpenters are standing here ready to build everything, you know? It's like, well, that wasn't great planning, you know? Just have to give us 15 minutes to design this thing. So we just always were staying up 24 hours a day until we're just completely stupid. When I was a kid, I always wanted to do stuff like that. So it was like, here's my chance. But then when you interact with real companies, then they have the way they do things, the thing they want to do, and then there's the thing you would, that, that Paul and I would like to do. And a lot of things we wanted to do, people wouldn't do because they cost a little bit more money to do or they had their own plan. Do, did you have any friction for like, uh, as far as style goes? Because it's so, it's like, it's completely unlike like anything that I remember as a kid watching up to that point. Well, this was kind of like the hippie dream, and it was the, the psychedelic, it's a psychedelic show, and it's also an art, a show made by artists, because like Rick Heitzman, Wayne White, my co-designers, and then all the fantastic people at Broadcast Arts and the other companies, they were all artists, and we put art history all over the show, you know? I mean, it's really like, I think Mike Kelly said, and I think it's right, that it's kind of like the Googie style, you know? It's like those LA type of coffee shops and stuff, but kind of psychedelic, over the top. I do think that like the environment and design can totally like enhance your brain power and stuff. You know, you see like nurseries that are designed like ellipses and things, you know, and uh, yeah. So we're deadening, we're working on deadening everybody around mm -hmm. here. Um, can you explain uh, what you did with the, the Paramount Hotel, like the, along those lines? Yeah, it was, yeah, that was a, it was a daycare center. Um, it was tiny, the, the, that place, that room, I don't know if you were there, but it was about as big as the kitchen. You know, it's like a little room, but I used mirrors and paint to make it seem a lot bigger. And then I did things that were like things I saw in bad acid trips, you know, just like, it wasn't stuff I want to put in my work, but it would work in a, in Pee Wee's Playhouse and the kids' room, in some ways they're more like bad acid trips in some ways, you know. Are those Emmys? Yeah. Nominated five times, one, three. Where's the third? Is it just like tucked away? Or? My mom has it in oh. Texas. Yeah. Yeah, they don't really, you know, they don't, I don't show my art much because they're afraid it's creepier than it is. It's not very creepy, you know, but they're always afraid it's going to be creepy, so I don't bother them with it. But an Emmy they can understand. It's like, okay. And I sent them the big book and they were kind of disturbed by it. Mm. Maybe I shouldn't have sent it to them. But how do you not send your parents a book like that? Yeah. Here I achieved something. Oh, okay. Maybe you better try again. Try harder. <laughs> Can you do a nice book? It's always fun to see people's records. This is this is in fact very true. My friend Devin and I are performing music. Oh, trying to. It's Devin Flynn, right? Yep. Oh, do you guys have a name? For your uh, project, Devin right? and Gary. Yeah, we have an ecstatic peace enough. record coming out. Oh, really? It's a 30-minute CD called Devin and Gary Go Outside. And I enjoy it, but I'm not, you know, I'm kind of faking my way through it. We performed at the cake shop the other night and totally froze up, and it was like, I did. And it was complete hell, and all of my uh, lyrics just, like, vanished. It was like, oh, I thought I knew these songs, but now <laughs> they're far away. And we just suffered through it, and no one seemed to notice. Is it just, is it basic guitar stuff or? I play certain? guitar and sing and uh, then Devin plays bass, keyboards and sound effects and he makes kind of, you know, we're running through a lot of pedals and stuff. Like all, every sound is running through something so there's kind of a sonic environment in a way. When did you start doing the light shows? I did it for about a year for a few hundred people. Then I did it at Pierogi Gallery after 9-11. About a year after 9-11 I did it, about 50 shows there and Joshua White came. And the years were, I'm not sure, 2002 or something. And then thereafter, Josh and I have been working on light shows. 
these bottles. Josh was here last week. He's doing a he's doing a week of light shows on the Guanas Canal next week, mm -hmm. and so we have to. The trick, one of the tricks with light shows, is getting colorful oils that are very pure, high high density colors. But we mix these pigments out of super strong aniline dyes. You know, we wear masks and gloves and stuff. And so anyway, Josh was here mixing up colors for the next light shows. But we have pigments left over from his show in the '60s, and. Uh, we have custom built overhead projectors that he built back then, or they had built, you know. So that's been a real trip, because he was one of my heroes from the 60s, and uh, and, he, and the little tiny light show attracted him in a way. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Doing little things, prototypes, is really cool sometimes. One thing that's interesting is just how complicated, figuring out all these light shows, that it seems really simple when it's up. It's fugitive in that we don't have a theater that we're set up in all the time. If you yeah. get installed in a theater and you have a budget, like at the Fillmore East, he had like eight or 10 people working with him. He had a woman that like mixed all, the, and people, they went all over the world to find the pit right pigments and just kept experimenting. And we've applied for grants and stuff and Josh is really working on it. So, uh, I mean, we might end up with a theater sometime or Josh should be in a theater, you know. I would definitely support whatever he wants to do. Overheat, they're, they're the company that's releasing the record from the 80s. They put out my LP, which I have here somewhere. This is it. Pray for Smurf. And uh, this was going to be called Smurfy Beaver Shots, but Matt Groening talked me out of it. <laughs> and uh, here's me on a painting over my car in my backyard in LA. And so anyway, finally that'll come out. It'll come out with a freak flag. Uh, and then uh, Devin Flynn and I, you know, our record's coming out, so. Awesome. Two records for a non-musician. <laughs> <laughs> you get brighter every day and every time I see you. Um, Those all the original Dal Tokyo? Yeah, now they want me to do color. You know, they've asked, they have a color option sometimes. And I've been trying it for a reggae magazine called Rhythm in Tokyo for, I don't know, 15 years or something, yeah, monthly. And so the first 200 of them will come out next year from Fantagraphics. When, but, you know, my wife and I have to slow up long enough to do the, to des, you know, she designs the books and I have to help. So was painting, uh, painting come first or would that like alternate with drawing when you were, were a kid? Well, yeah, I could always draw. So it's easier to draw. Yeah. To paint, then you have to learn. To, like when you're, uh, when I was a little kid, you get the water, I got the watercolor set and it was like those little brushes are horrible, you know, yeah. and they're like, ugh, this is awful. And I really started painting seriously in high school, painting big canvases in the garage, you know, like six by eight foot canvases and stuff. And so, yeah, I was always, my father's a cowboy and Indian painter. And so, yeah, I was a art nerd. It looked like Graham Sutherland or uh, anything I liked. I was just kind of absorbing everything. Picasso was always a big influence, and pop artists, and especially the English pop artist. Ed Ruscha was always a big influence, uh, the California pop artist. When I moved into this little room, instead of being in a giant studio, I was painting paintings that were about this size. And so for me, it's easy for me to paint on holocord doors. And then when the paintings are done, I, you know, I'll cut this in half and then these, I'll restretch these on panels. And this will be like a little bit shorter, a little bit thinner. And I have wider doors and things so I can, you know, reformat them after I painted them. And so I'm thinking, you know, when I'm painting the painting, I'm knowing that I'm going to lose like, you know, an eighth of an inch off the top and bottom. I do certain kinds of drawings that are going to head towards paintings and they're meant to be, they're either plans for paintings themselves or they're things I photocopy and then re-collage and that becomes a painting. And you're just kind of riffing. One thing I think stands out about you is that there's not, there's not this like negative sort of like kind of overbearing anti-materialist feel to it and maybe I'm, maybe I'm just getting it wrong. No, but, I'm not like political that way. Yeah. I mean, certainly like I don't litter, you know. I try not to litter. <laughs> <laughs> but I still like use you know, like five tons of plastic a year, you know. Uh, now there's all kinds of like subtext in them. They're pretty positive in some ways. I mean, 
it's a weird world. It's a world that's really cool and has really happy babies in it, and then it has like really unhappy babies in it, you know. And so, doing kind of a hieroglyph about humanity's detritus in a way, or however you pronounce the word. <laughs>